Crossing the Simpson Desert remains one of the iconic overlanding challenges for many Australian off-roaders. In March 21, a group of us planned to cross the Simpson following the Madigan Line before COVID restrictions and some late rain closed off access to that route. In June 22, we mustered the group together at Mount Dare for another attempt at the crossing. We followed dusty station tracks to the Northern Territory border, where we soon joined the bins track for an easy run to Old Andado. The Old Andado homestead sits on the very edge of the Simpson Desert, between a couple of fringing sand ridges. We paused for another snoop around at this iconic old place and had a bite of lunch while we were there. Madigan's team gathered here before heading into the desert. This was their last taste of civilization until Birdsville. Well, day one of our Madigan Line crossing. I left Mount Dare this morning and uh, we pulled up for lunch at the fabulous Old Andado Station, which, as many of you might know, is a bit of a living museum. The former residence of Mac and Molly Clark, and she left it fully furnished, all of her personal belongings, a pantry full of 80s and 90s produce. And thankfully, it still hasn't been disturbed or vandalised and there's now caretakers looking after the place again. So from here we're going to keep on heading north. We'll go past Madigan Camp Zero at the Old North Bore and start making our way along the track. Hopefully we'll leave some of these flies behind. From out there we headed to the official start point of the 1939 Madigan Expedition at the Andado North Ball. Heading further north we stopped briefly at the Acacia Puce Reserve established with tremendous foresight by Mac Clark to protect these rare trees. We continued the track almost due north, but were unable to follow Madigan's original route from the ball to Camp 5 because of restrictions put in place by the traditional owners who have special places in this area. Instead, we passed Camp 1A marker, which is roughly five kilometres east of the expedition's actual first night camp. Our own first camp was made below the sandstone face of Marshall's Bluff, amongst thousands of whirling budgerigars.
The initial 10 kilometres of travel on day two was on hard clay and gibber flats until the track started running between and across sand ridges. Mid-morning we crossed into land governed by our Central Land Council permits, a condition of which means no more drone flights until we reach Queensland. From Camp 5 we turn due east and start crossing some of the bigger dunes of the Madigan Line. We adopted a steady routine of climbing the dunes slowly in second low gear, then coasting down the face of them across the swale in third low range. This made it easy for the vehicle, the passengers and the track. Okay, well day two on the Madigan line. We went from Marshall Bluff and we're at Camp 7 for the night, which is quite a wide swale, relatively clear. Um, yeah, a little bit of corrugation straight out of Marshall Bluff, but once you get on the track, other than the whoops, it's all pretty, uh, pretty good going at the moment. No wheel spin, nice firm track. Anyhow, um, yeah, good day. Beautiful weather, terrific amount of bird life, and uh, the desert in really great shape, as you can see. So we'll be back on the track in the morning, probably get to Camp 12 or so is our plan, and we'll uh, fill you in a bit more then. On the steeper, lumpier dunes, I engaged the rear diff lock to help protect the track from further damage, which would be caused by spinning a wheel in the low points.
Some of the largest whales contained clumps of Gitche and mulberry trees, which all made for attractive campsites. The Camp 11 site includes some interesting signs that explain how the yellow camp markers placed by Owen Correa in 1994 are incorrectly placed for camps 12, 13 and 14. Good morning, day four on the Madigan line. Last night we camped at Madigan's clay pan, which is about 10 kilometers past Camp 11. It's uh, in a big swale full of gidgee trees that uh, evidently would have held water at certain times. Another cool morning, about four or five degrees. And yesterday never got above 12, even though it was bright and sunny, it felt much warmer. So really great conditions for touring the desert and even the flies haven't been too bad in the last couple of days. Another great sunrise and uh, we get stuck into making some brekkie and keep chugging along. So far the rig's going fine, no real problems, nothing coming loose. We've just been ambling along, uh, second gear low, crawling over the sand dunes, no wheel spin, really good track conditions. We had to do a few uh, road repairs where other people have been chewing it up and for some reason people are still going up the eastern face of the dunes. That's where we found most of the holes, um, which is strange when you're supposed to be going west to east. Anyhow, time to uh, get stuck into the rest of the day. Talk to you soon. We came across some large areas of burnt spinifex that revealed the full impact of the deep red sand.
Not far along the track, we unhitched the trailers and took an overland excursion to the football field clay pan, accurately described by Madigan in his journal. We found that somebody had defaced the Camp 12 marker plaque, perhaps as a protest to it being in the wrong place. Well, day four on the track. Last night we camped at Camp 13, which is a great little clay pan, or actually quite a big clay pan. Quiet night, bit of company with a dingo scratching around. And today we'll head across, meet the Hay River track, and stop near Camp 16, which of course is a blazed tree. We reached Camp 15 on its junction with the Hay River track, and here we turned north to inspect an old Aboriginal tool making midden. Although mostly dry, the Hayes Riverbed had eroded down to limestone bedrock and the higher moisture content supported gums and other trees not seen in the desert. One such tree is at Camp 16, in which Madigan blazed M39 to signify his expedition's passing. In his journal, Madigan questions who might see his mark. Although it's now grown over with bark, it's unlikely he could have foreseen 
just how popular his desert crossing route would become. After overnighting near Camp 16, we headed eastward again, soon passing Camp 17 and crossing the Northern Territory Queensland border to enter the Mungathiri National Park. Note that traversing this section of track requires permission from owners of Adria Down Station. Probably a little hard to see there, but in terms of tyre pressures, Hot pressures, 15 pound in the front. Started off at 12 this morning. 19 in the rear. They started off at 16 this morning. And uh, in the trailer we're running 15 hot. And again, they started off as 12 this morning. So sort of mid afternoon now, two o'clock. And yeah, this is about as warm as they've been getting. It's about 20 degrees ambient. So you can see those uh, lightly loaded wheels and tyres get up to uh, 25, 26 degrees. And the rears, depending on which side's hit getting the sun, the rears are up around that 30 degree mark. So 9 or 10 degrees above ambient. From Camp 17 to 18 and 19, we were headed to the southeast, spending longer time driving between sand dunes, which increased our speed and improved fuel economy. Today we crossed the Queensland border and uh, we're currently between camps 18 and 19. We'll stop down near 19 for the night. Um, pretty warm, low 20s, but the track is in really good shape still, nice and firm. No wheel spin at all, climbing these dunes, even towing. Um, not as many washouts and wombat holes, so less traffic on this part of the track. We're now east of the Hay River track. A lot of people come out of the Madigan line and go down the Hay River track to Popal Corner. So this section's less travelled, which is good. Um, yeah, nice and firm. Country's in great shape still. Not much wildlife yet, other than bird life. Um, so yeah, we'll have a talk to you when we get to camp in an hour or so. and. We've got dinner on the go already. Got some mozzarella chicken in the travel buddy. We just put that in so it's heating up on the drive into camp and by the time we get the tea van set up, we'll be ready for dinner. See you then.
another cool but fine morning as we leave the National Park and enter grazing land. It's here that we also meet the 130 year old rabbit proof fence, which wasn't very rabbit proof, and then it was upgraded to be a dog fence, but now it's half buried and doesn't keep out much at all. All the same, it's an amazing feature that a hand built fence can survive out here for so long in the desert. The track continues its way down the flood out country of Air Creek, signalling an increase in trees, more clay pans and the white sediment floor between sand dunes. Camp 20 is on an idyllic spot on a wide grassy flat beside the mostly permanent waters of Cuddery Waterhole. The track continues following Air Creek southward until it reaches Camp 21, which is last of the Madigan camps accessible to the public. A few kilometres further and we reach ruins of Annandale Station, which was already abandoned when Madigan was here in 1939. Annandale is another time capsule of pastoral history, with the remains of century-old steam engine pumps and other agricultural machinery spread around the homestead grounds. This corner of Australia was a real crossroads of exploration in the late 1800s. Some evidence of that is a small plaque claiming that this was the location of Captain Charles Sturt's furthest push northward on his search for the Great Inland Sea. We continued following the flower lined air creek until it intersected the QAA line where we turned east for our final push into Birdsville.
But of course, there was one more obstacle to confront. Big Red emerged on the horizon. Down that side, darling. Don't, don't go down there. What do you have? Come on, now. Come on, Shane. Oh, he's. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! With playtime over, we rehitched the trailers and rolled into Birdsville. According to HEMA, we traversed 768 kilometres from Mount Dare to Birdsville, and the 200 series Land Cruiser consumed 205 litres of diesel along the way. Now it's time to head home and repack, for we soon head on to Lynn Bedell's Rocket Roads through the South Australia, Western Australia desert. Subscribe to join the next adventure.